So in this part of the lecture, I'm going to focus on mechanistic explanation. This is a topic which has received a lot of attention amongst philosophers of neuroscience in the last 20 or so years. And we can think of it as really one of the dominant ways of, of trying to understand and make sense of neuroscientific explanation. The core idea is that when neuroscientists give explanations, what they're trying to do is describe mechanisms that go on in the brain. There's an intuitive connection between giving explanations and uncovering mechanisms. So if you take a device like a refrigerator, if you know what the mechanism is behind its cooling process, you would say you understand how the machine works. And having that knowledge would also allow you to fix that machine if it went wrong. So similarly, in the case of biological systems like the brain, knowing the mechanism is connected with saying you know how this system works and also potentially would allow you to alter the system, especially in the case of something going wrong. On this slide, I've given you three definitions of mechanism, which have been influential in recent discussions amongst philosophers. So you'll notice that these definitions use sort of very general terms. They're not talking about biological systems or machines or artifacts. They're talking about, you know, in general terms such as entities and activities and laws of nature and processes. But the core idea is that what mechanisms are, are delimited sets of causal interactions that produce a phenomenon. So you can think of them as made up of tiny sets of working parts. Each part has a specific role in the system. And altogether, that system produces the phenomenon that you're trying to explain. I've given an example on this slide of a mechanism which is described in neuroscientific textbooks. It's called a sodium potassium pump. And it's interesting that that word pump is a kind of device that people make in order to move water from one place to another. But in this case, it's not a machine or an artifact that is being described. It's actually a protein, which is a very large molecule, which spans the membra membrane or cell wall boundary of a neuron. This protein, when it gets an energy source from ATP, will change its shape. And this causes sodium ions to be expelled from inside the cell and potassium ions to enter the cell. This is part of the system by which neurons maintain an electrical charge across their surface. And that's very important for the signaling which goes on in the brain. So this, is a, this, this sodium potassium pump um, has entities like the transmembrane protein and the ions and activities that happen of ions moving around and the protein changing shape. So you can see how it fits a definition such as Makima, Darden and Craver having these start and finish conditions as depicted on this, um, on this textbook diagram here. So a lot of work in neuroscience seems to be about coming up with accounts like these of look, looking at the minute workings of the brain and seeing how all of these processes sort of fit together in order to produce um, phenomena that the scientists are know are really important for um, all of the things that the brain does, including signal transmission, ultimately allowing you to think and do all the other things that you do with your brain. Now, not every scientific model provides explanations. Some just describe data patterns or allow scientists to make predictions of future events. So one of the things that philosophers have been interested to find out is what is it that makes some models explanatory and not others? And an answer that these philosophers have come up with, these are David Kaplan and Carl Craver, is that models provide explanations to the extent that they describe mechanisms. And then there's this further question about what does it mean? What are the conditions for describing or representing a mechanism? And this is what they answer with what they call the 
3M or models to mechanism mapping criterion. The basic idea of the models to mechanism mapping criteria is quite straightforward. So if you think of a map of a city, what's depicted in that representation in that map is some of the entities, not all of the entities that are there in the city, and their connections between one another in space. So you can think of a scientific representation of a mechanism as again pinpointing some of the entities which are there in that living system, the ones that are crucial to the mechanism, and depicting their relationship to one another. But it's also worth thinking here about some of the deeper meanings in the background of this word mechanism. So philosophers of neuroscience today who write about mechanisms like to point out or insist that the whole idea of a mechanism is not really tied to machines and devices that people make. But at least etymologically, what a mechanism is, is a, is a machine. Um, you can see this in these dictionary definitions of mechanisms, that what's being, like the primary meaning is a system of moving parts, which one might find in a machine, or also analogously, one might find in an animal, like the mechanism of the ear, the example given here. Historically, the word mechanism comes from that Latin word machine. And interestingly, the original Greek word meant something like a trick or a ruse, like a device put together to create some unexpected effect. So the core meaning of that word mechanism is devices that people have made. And then by analogy, we th can think of systems in nature as comprising mechanisms. Now, this idea that we can think of both living systems and man-made systems as being sets of mechanisms goes back quite a long way to early modern natural philosophy. So there was this idea that was um, introduced in the 17th century by people like Robert Hooke and Rene Descartes that we could think of the whole of the natural world as made up of tiny particles, and those particles were organized in particular ways which brought about the phenomena that we see in the world around us. So the example on the left here is a microscopic image um, of needles in a stinging nettle. So at this time, microscopes were a new invention, and it was a really exciting idea for people to look at the tiny parts of nature and to try and figure out how things like stinging nettles worked by depicting them or figuring out the ways that those tiny parts had particular effects like the pointedness of the needles. In Descartes' work on optics, he's full of examples of the way that we can think of processes of light as due to the interactions of tiny particles. And he gives you diagrams like these of a barrel of balls of stuff which jostle around, and you're supposed to think of movements of light beams as analogous to some of these processes that you can see um, macroscopically with big particles as well. A really important um, development of this era is the idea that you could think of living bodies as machines. So Descartes famously talked about animals as being automata, as being just really, really complicated physiological machines. He didn't think that human beings were just machines because he said that we have a rational soul as well. So we have a different kind of substance going on that was connected to our brains, but not just our brains, which is our rational soul. But, and that accounted for thinking and consciousness and will in humans. But he thought that everything else that went on including the perceptual capacities that animals have, was just the result of, of complicated mechanisms there in our bodies. When you get to the 20th century, when the sciences of the mind and brain are really taking the shape that we know them today, this idea of the body being a machine becomes all the more important. By this stage, psychologists like Clark Hull are not thinking that we have a rational soul, anything separate from the physical substance of our body. So he's saying that in order to understand how humans think, 
you need to uncover the mechanisms that are there in our brains, in our nervous systems. And it's interesting that he points out one way to try and understand mechanisms like that is to try and build machines that do the same things that mechanisms do in living organisms. So this is a this is a case where doing engineering, actually trying to build systems that replicate biological functions, is thought to be a way of also doing biology. So just to sum up this section, I've talked about the relationship between you know, knowing what a mechanism for something is and having an understanding of how it works and how you could alter that system. There are plenty of examples from neuroscience of places where neuroscientists have described some of the tiny working parts of the brain in terms of mechanisms, which fit these philosophers' definitions of what mechanisms are in general. And that is one of the central ways that neuroscientists have tried to explain how, how the brain works, and especially how the brain gives rise to cognition. So this final example for this part of the lecture is from a textbook depiction of this process known as long-term potentiation and long-term depression. This is a mechanism by which the connections between neurons, the synapses, get strengthened or weakened. And this is thought to be one of the core process, processes involved in memory formation and memory regulation. So if your big explanatory question is, how do memories function, how do memories form, then looking at mechanisms like LTP and LTD will be part of the story.